In this question, we are asked to evaluate this integral, and we're going to be using the method of trigonometric substitution. Now, how do we know that it is indeed trigonometric substitution? Well, perhaps to really see it, what you're gonna to wanna to do is the following. Take the quantity that's underneath the square root, and you're going to rewrite that in a very strategic manner. So you're going to have the square root of t squared minus, and then one, you'll notice is a perfect square, so you can rewrite that as one squared. And so you then sort of focus your attention on this expression right here. And that expression involves the square root of a variable squared minus a constant squared. It's a very specific scenario. But if you look at the three expressions in the left-hand column here, you should be able to identify a similar pattern. And hopefully you can see that this pattern matches the pattern in our problem because over here, we also have the square root of a variable squared minus a constant squared. Notice in our case, the constant, which is denoted by the letter a, is just one. So our a is equal to one in this problem. And now that we've identified the correct expression, the first thing that we're actually going to do here to get this problem going is make the following substitution. So we're going to let our variable which notices t rather than x, and we're going to let that equal our a secant of theta, just like that. So that's your first step. Your second step is to compute the derivative. So you're going to compute the derivative of t with respect to theta. So basically that just means you're going to have dt equals, well, whatever the derivative of secant of theta is. We learned earlier that the derivative of sec theta is sec theta tan theta and then you'll have a d theta here notationally. So that's your second step. The third thing you're going to do is take your expression and you're going to make some substitutions. So why don't we come down below here? And for step three, we will make those substitutions. So we're going to rewrite the integral in terms of theta really is what we're doing. You'll have one over. Now, we have t cubed in the denominator. We remember that t was equal to sec theta. That would mean that t cubed is equal to secant cubed of theta. So you'll just place a secant cubed of theta in the denominator here. Then you have your square root. Then you have t squared. Well, go back to the original substitution. t was equal to sec theta. If you square both sides of that, you can see that t squared equals secant squared of theta. So that's the substitution we'll make next is secant squared theta. Then we just have minus one. Remember one squared is just one. And then we multiply by dt. But let's not forget that dt back in step two was equal to secant of theta times tangent of theta. And then you have d theta right there. Now notice the numerator one and this numerator here can be multiplied together. So if I multiply one times sec theta tan theta, I would of course just get sec theta tan theta. So my preference is to just move this into the numerator over here and then we can move the d theta kind of on the side right there. All right, so far so good. That was the third step. The fourth step is to make this substitution over here. We can see that secant squared of theta minus one is equal to tangent squared of theta. So in the fourth step, you make that substitution. You replace secant squared of theta minus one with tan squared of theta. So we've gone ahead and have made that substitution, but then if you look carefully, things start to simplify. So really your fifth step is to do as much simplifying as you possibly can. We have the square root of tangent squared. And of course the square root and the square kind of undo each other. So you would actually be left there with just tangent of theta. And then we'll fill in the rest. Now look carefully, in the numerator, you have a factor of tangent theta, but then you also have a factor of tan theta in the denominator. So those factors can cancel out like so. And we continue the process of simplifying. We can actually cancel out a factor of sec theta as well. So this sec theta will cancel to become one. This sec cubed, well, one of those will cancel to just become sec squared. So in fact, now we're left with one over secant squared of theta d theta. So it's becoming a much simpler integral, but we're not done simplifying it. We recall, of course, that the secant of theta is equal to one over cosine theta. You can actually flip that around and say one over secant theta is equal to cosine theta. Notice if you square both sides of this equation right here, you would get one squared, which is just one, secant squared over here, and then cosine squared 
right here. So we can see that one over secant squared is actually equivalent to cosine squared. So we're going to make that substitution as well. And the reason we do that is because there's an identity that's going to help us out here. So here is that identity we probably learned in the previous section that the cosine squared of your variable is equal to half times one plus cosine of two times your variable. So we're going to make that replacement. We'll rewrite cosine squared as one half times one plus cosine of two theta d theta. We can factor out this one half. So now we'll have the integral of one plus cosine of two theta d theta. Now we're ready to integrate finally with respect to theta. Hopefully we remember the following formula for the integral of cosine of k theta. You could do a u substitution, but I like the following shortcut. You end up with just one over k, where k is a constant, times the sine of k theta. So we'll refer to that in just a moment, but let's go ahead and begin the integration process. The integral of one with respect to theta is just theta. And now we can use that identity, or not really an identity, but an integration formula that we just shared. Notice your k would be two in this case. So you're going to have one over two sine of two theta. So there, we've integrated it. We must make sure that this was, or we must recall, excuse me, that this was a definite integral. So we have these bounds from radical two to positive two. Now those bounds are in terms of t. Don't forget that. These values here and here are both t values. But right now, our problem is in terms of theta. So we're not gonna be able to put the same bounds onto our integral because those were t values rather than theta values. So in other words, we're going to next change the bounds. Now to change the bounds, we recall that our original substitution was all the way back here, it was to let t equal the secant of theta. So let's write that down again. t was equal to the secant of theta. Then we go back and we look at our lower bound. Our lower bound was the square root of two. That's a t value, so go ahead and put that in for t. You have square root of two equals secant theta. Remember that the secant of theta is one over cosine theta. And then we can do a little trick here, I suppose. We can reciprocate both sides. In other words, flip both sides upside down. So you have one over square root of two is equal to cosine of theta over one. And then if we rationalize the denominator here, we multiply the bottom by root two and the top by root two. So we have root two over two equals cosine of theta. Now, what angle has a cosine equal to root two over two? Well, we remember from pre-calculus that that's pi over four. So that's our lower bound right there. Let's do the same sort of process for our upper bound. Remember the upper bound was two. So we would plug two in for t into this little formula here and then proceed in the same manner. We have two equals one over cos theta, reciprocate both sides. And then we recall that the cosine of a 60 degree angle, AKA pi over three is equal to half. So this is your new upper bound. And then your new lower bound was the pi over four. Let's use those bounds in this expression right here. So we'll copy and paste that down below. And we've changed the bounds successfully. Uh, our lower bound was the pi over four and our upper bound was pi over three. So let's plug in the upper bound first. We'll have pi over three plus one half sine of two times pi over three, so it's two pi over three. And then we'll subtract that from one half, plug in the lower bound of pi over four, plus one half sine. Now be careful here, this is going to be two times pi over four. If you were to reduce that, you would get pi over two. So we might wanna actually just rewrite that as sine of pi over two. And then the rest is just simplifying. Now, hopefully we recall that the sine of two pi over three is root three over two. So this quantity right there is gonna be root three over two. So we'll have one half times root three over two minus one half inside here. We have pi over four plus one half times in the sine of 
Pi over two is just one, so it's just one half times one. Why don't we just leave that as one half? You could leave your answer like this. The rest is just sort of algebraic fancy pants simplifying. So if you're doing this on an online homework system, you're welcome to just leave it as that. For those of you interested in impressing your friends, you see here that you have a common factor of one half. So you can factor out a one half. That's gonna leave you with pi over three plus. Well, if you multiply these together, you're gonna multiply the numerators to get root three, multiply the denominators to get four, and then you have minus. Now be careful here, this minus sign will distribute. So you'd actually have minus pi over four and then minus one half. I suppose then you could go ahead and subtract pi over three minus pi over four, find a common denominator, you'd have, let's see, you're gonna put it over 12, you'd have four pi over 12 minus three pi over 12. Oh, neat, that's just pi over 12. So you'll have one half bracket pi over 12 plus root three over four minus a half, and that's just another way of expressing the answer.